Hello everyone. Welcome to part 8 of the lecture series. So in this particular tutorial, I'm going to talk about DNA mutations. So everything you need to know about DNA mutations, I will probably be able to cover it here. And I don't think there is much more to learn from bioinformatician rather than this. If you know these basics, you can start working with mutations and build up your knowledge base. So if you want to fully understand the video, I will certainly recommend that you watch the other videos that come forward that came before part 0 to part 7. But if you are not that patient, then I will at least tell you to watch part 5 because part 5 has a lot of linkage to this video. So without further ado, let's get started. So first of all, let's just recap on one thing. We have this double-stranded DNA. So I have written a very small portion of the DNA, ATA, GCA and so on. And this is the complementary strand we all know. A complementary base of A is T, complementary base of T is A, and so on and so forth. So this is the double-stranded DNA. And let's say this first strand, which is the forward strand, suppose, it transforms itself into mRNA. mRNA means messenger RNA through a process called transcription. I covered this in part 5. And we all know that A will convert to T, but there is no T in RNA. So it will ultimately be U, which is uracil. T will convert to A, A will convert to again U, G will convert to C, and so on and so forth. So this is the mRNA. Ultimately, each three, each three bases of the mRNA is called a codon. Okay, so this is a codon, this is another codon, and so on and so forth. So each of these codons will transform themselves into an amino acid. So you can see that this codon transformed into TYR and this one into ARG and so on and so forth. So you have this table right here. I showed this table in my previous tutorials. Probably in part 5 you will also see this. So it has the mapping from codon to amino acid. For example, these two codons transform into PHE amino acid and so on and so forth. So 64 codons are here and there are 20 unique amino acids. So this is prior knowledge. We all know this. Now what happens with mutation happens? So first of all, let's talk about non-synonymous mutation. So what is non-synonymous mutation? When the synthesized protein changes, when the synthesized amino acid rather I should say, changes because of some change in the DNA, then it is called non-synonymous mutation. Let me give you an example. So you have ATA right here. Suppose T mutated or changed into A for some reason. If that happens, then this will be U. Right, this complementary strand, complementary base of mRNA will be U. And ultimately, if you look at the table, triple U is actually PHE. So this will be PHE, which is different from TYR. So this is a non-synonymous mutation. Now, this is also called missense mutation because it is changing the sense of the amino acid. It is changing the amino acid. But there is also another type of non-synonymous mutation, which is known as nonsense mutation. So what is nonsense mutation? If after the mutation, the synthesized amino acid is a stop codon. So you can see that some of the codons are actually becoming stop, stop amino acid. So what is a stop codon or a stop amino acid? So when some stop codon is phased, suppose if, if we had UAA here, UAA, then the synthesis of protein from the mRNA will immediately stop. So what happens when a stop codon appears because of mutation? Normally, nothing actually happens. The protein does not get synthesized. Basically, you will not get a, like, what should I say, regular protein. It will be destroyed ultimately. Okay? That is the thing. So, it will hamper the protein synthesis process because it will prematurely give you a stop codon to stop the protein synthesis. So, that's basically missense and nonsense mutation. But there is another type of mutation. Let me show you here. Which is called synonymous mutation. So as you can, you can already guess what's going on here. So ATA here, suppose A becomes G because of mutation. And ultimately G will become C in mRNA. And UAC is actually TYR. So you can see UAC here, it is TYR. So UAC is also TYR. UAU is also TYR. So it is what? It is a synonymous mutation. Right? That means the amino acid did not change. So this kind of mutation actually does nothing. So all mutations aren't really doing anything bad in your body. So numerous mutations basically do nothing. There is one other thing I want to mention here. Mutant mutations only in the protein coding regions of the genome. By the way, protein coding regions we discussed in detail in the gene expression video in the part 5 uh, lecture as well. So as I mentioned before, 
we need to look into part 5 to understand this fully so if the mutation occurs in protein coding regions only then something may happen now the issue is protein coding regions are only 1 to 2 percent of the human genome we all know that from previous lectures that is why these mutations most often will not do anything but sometimes it can do something if there is non mass mutation in the protein coding region plus the amino acid that is synthesized is actually doing some harm or changing the protein fold significantly. Again, protein folding, we talked about this in the previous lecture, part 7. So, you can look into that. Now, let's talk about the next thing, which is a different type of mutation, frame shift mutation. So, so far, if you look closely here, we are simply talking about a substitution, right? T is being substituted by A and here A is being substituted by G. So, it's a kind of substitution replacement but there can also be insertion and deletion in the dna so what happens if an insertion happens let's see so this is exactly the same thing as i showed you right here so let's look at this so suppose there is an a inserted right after this a right so a t a becomes a a t a so you can see that an insertion happened a become a comes here then this T comes here, this A comes here, this G comes here, this C comes here and so on and so forth. I haven't written the other one, it will be just complementary, you can guess it. Now, the issue here is the entire frame has been shifted and since the amino acid synthesis comes in groups of three, now AAT will become UUA, the mRNA, obviously the mRNA is, I mean we all know this, so the mRNA will completely be different. Now, and the protein synthesis, the amino acids will also be completely different because UUA makes LEU, which is different from TYR. ARG makes, I mean, ARG is replaced by ACR, THR is replaced by TYR, and so on and so forth. So, the entire protein is actually completely different. Now, you may be thinking that this can wreak havoc in our body. It is true, but the thing is, most often, this kind of insertion deletion result in some protein which is not stable and it just gets destroyed in the body. So, most often it doesn't really do anything, but it can do something obviously and obviously most often this will not be a valid protein. So, this can hamper your protein synthesis. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about two very, very important concepts. First of all, I will talk about heterozygous and homozygous mutation and then I will talk about germline and somatic mutation, which is related to this concept. So, obviously we know from I think lecture one, part one of the series, that one of our alleles come from the father and the other one comes from the mother. It's because we are deployed, right? Because we have we have a pair of copy for each gene, for each chromosome, for everything. Now suppose there was a mutation in the mother's cell, in the mother's germline cell. Again, what is germline cell? I will mention in two minutes. So suppose the mother had some mutation in her germline cell. So that mutation will be passed down to the child it can be a harmful mutation as well okay so if the father doesn't have that mutation then this is a heterozygous mutation so it's, it's heterozygous basically now what is homozygous so if both the parents have this mutation then both the adults will have this mutation and then it will be homozygous mutation now homozygous mutations are very very dangerous because now you don't have any any mechanism to defend your body against some potential harm if this mutation is harmful and both of your alleles are actually screwed then you know what's happening. So there is a high chance that heterozygous mutation will also become homozygous mutation because through environmental activity, through radiation or through other things, this allele can also get the mutation. So if one of your allele already has a mutation, then obviously it's just one more allele to go, right? So if you have heterozygous mutation still, you're going to be more, you will have like higher tendency of getting that disease. So people sometimes say that cancer disease is genetical. It comes down from the parents. It is true. Cancer disease is often genetical because if one of the parents or both of the parents have cancer, then this type of mutation can actually be there. The cancer mutation can be there in the body. Person will be much more prone to cancer than a normal person. Now, the main question is, <laughs> do all mutations actually come down from parent to children? That is the main question. Actually, the answer is no. Only the germline mutations 
are passed down from parent to children. So what is germline mutation? These are mutations that are only found in sperm or ovary. So sperm for males and ovary for females. And these are called germline cells. So cells that are there in sperm or ovary, these are called germline cells. And these cells are haploid. This is very, very crucial information. I haven't talked about this before because I did not need to. That means pair of alleles aren't there. There is only one allele in these particular cells, germline cells. So what is that allele? So each allele is actually chosen randomly from mother or father during birth. That is the thing. So our normal cells, which is in our cheek, in our mouth, tongue, etc., they have a pair of alleles coming from both mother and mother. But our germline cells, they have only one allele for each gene, for each chromosome and everything. And that comes from either father or the mother, randomly chosen. Okay. So only if the mutation has spread into germline cells, then it can actually go to the children. So what is somatic mutation? The first thing is it is not passed down to the children. So it is found in somatic cells. So somatic cells is everything except for germline cells. So all the cells in our body. And they are definitely deployed as we have been talking about those from much earlier on. And we get one allele from each parent in these pairs. So that is the thing. So let's talk about the reasons behind mutation. One major reason is error in DNA replication. So what is the error in DNA replication? Suppose this is your original DNA strand. So DNA replication process, again, I talked about this in detail in part five. So we'll have a look into that. So this is the original strand and this is the replicated strand using DNA polymerase. Now it is supposed to have the complementary basis, right? So this, this is supposed to be T, this is supposed to be T, this is supposed to be G because CG, right? But you can see that there is one mistake right here in the replication process. And this kind of mistake can especially happen if your body is under stress. Suppose you are having cancer or something like that and the cells are growing uncontrollably. In that kind of cases, these replication errors will happen more often. But in normal human beings, it is much more rarer and there are like repair mechanisms for that. So we don't need to worry that much about this, but it can happen. Now, the thing is, after this replicated strand has been created, later on, this will become the original strand, which I'm showing here. And this will again become replicated through DNA replication to create new DNA. And you can see that if the replication process is correct, then what will happen is this error will keep on propagating, which is not good. Okay and it will go into the protein as well, as we saw in earlier slide. So another source of mutation is the germline mutations passed on by parents, which we discussed in the earlier slide. And the last one is this one. So now that our ozone layer is getting hammered because of all the greenhouse gas and, and pollution and etc., UV light from the sun is now ever on the rise and that can hamper our body. X-ray, gamma ray and other radiations can also uh, induce stress in the cells and can cause mutations in DNA. So now let's talk about maximum variant allele frequency, max VAF. So this is a very, very important measurement, which is used to measure how much mutation has occurred in our body. So let's talk about VAF. So first of all, let's look at this. Suppose we have cancer, suppose we have colon cancer. So it's a particular type of cancer. So some of the cells, uh, you can see that they are going uncontrollably and they are cancer induced. But all cells are not cancer induced here. A particular, particular, I mean, some particular cells are cancer induced. So let's say we take this part of the tissue, part of the colon tissue, and we put this through sequencing and alignment, which we normally do. So this is, I think, in part two of our lecture series, how to do sequencing, how to do alignment. Make sure to check out those. So basically, in this course, if you're going sequentially, then you, are, you will understand everything that I'm saying. Okay. Now, after alignment, you are going to see something like this, right? So, so these are reads. These are reads coming from the genome, coming from the sequencing. So if you align these reads to the reference genome, you are going to see that there, there are some mismatches in each column. And those mismatches are probably because of sequencing error, right? Because there will be some sequencing error in some of the reads. But you can see this column right here, there are a lot of A's, which is different from the majority G right? That means a lot of reads actually have this particular mismatch. That means most likely there is some kind of mutation going on here. That means these cells don't have the same DNA as these cells. That is why. One more thing I want to mention here is when you want to calculate VAF or variant allele frequency, you can see that we have gathered a lot of reads. We have aligned a lot of reads to the same place, right? That means you need to have deep whole genome sequencing or deep targeted sequencing. Ideally, you should have 
deep targeted sequencing in the genes of interest. Because in that case, we're going to have many, many copies of the reads mapped in the same place. And so it is to be much easier for you to understand whether mismatch is because of chance like these places or it is actual mismatch and it is actual mutation. Okay, so let me see, say this, at a certain genome position such as this one, if you have 100 reads aligned in total, right, and 20 of them supports a mutation, so here I think maybe 5 of them supporting mutated mutation, then in this case mutation VAF will be 20% because 20 out of 100, right, that is the thing. Now, as you have identified 3 such mutations in your genes, right, which is TP53, CRAS and APC. Now, these three mutations are very, very common mutations for cancer. I mean, you don't need to memorize this, but every cancer type has its signature mutations, which is normally seen in those. So among these three mutations, the max is 0.61. So this will be the reported max VF. So why do we care about max VF? So basically, the mutation carrying the max VF is likely to be the driver mutation. So what is driver mutation? Driver mutation is the mutation that initiates the disease, such as cancer. So the other mutations that, are, that have lower VAFs, probably they have occurred because of the driver mutation. So what happens is you can see these cells right here, they are not really well formed. So their replication process is not really on point. And that is why probably those other mutations happened. And they are called passenger mutations. So they are not that crucial for us. And so we don't really care that much about them. So we mainly care about the max VAF. Now, there are some VAF colors available, such as Mutec2, Strelka2, Viruscan2, Vanid, etc. They will actually show you which places have the mutations and, they, and you can also visualize them. So they are very good tools to work with. Now, there is one other type of mutation which is called Single Nucleotide Polymorphism or SNP in short. Now, these mutations simply express diversity in population. So what do I mean by that? Say we have three people, Asian, Black, and European. So these three people, they will obviously have some genetic variation. It will be very small, but they will have some genetic variation. And those variations are known as SNP. These, those are natural variations. They are not harmful. So, I mean, these variations that we're talking about, we are saying SNP, they are mostly germline mutations because, I mean, we can clear, we clearly know from the previous slide that Germline mutations are mutations that pass on from parent to child, right? That is why when two black people marry, they have a black child. When two Asian guys, when an Asian guy and an Asian woman marry each other, they will have probably an Asian child, right? It happens because it's a germline mutation. That is why. There is no other reason. And finally, if you want to know more or if you want to find a list of these SNPs, then there is a database called DB SNP. So that is all for the mutation lecture from my part. So I hope that if you follow part 0 to part 8 of this series, you should know everything you need to know about bioinformatics, biology of bioinformatics basically. Now, in the next lecture, I will talk about selfie DNA, which is not a fundamental thing, but it is a very a new thing which is revolutionizing cancer research. So I want to talk about that. So I will give the link in the description. So make sure to check that out. Thank you very much.